What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of The Opinion. And let's talk about it. We're going to talk about them Texas Longhorns today because all offseason, everybody else has been talking about the Texas Longhorns. Obviously, they're new to the SEC, so they've been getting a lot of hype in the SEC. So we're going to talk about them as well. So headed into the 2024 offseason or in the 2024 offseason, all of the media outlets within college football have really been talking up Texas. They've really been the talk of the town, not just, you know, in the SEC, but in all of college football. And then we just concluded SEC Media Days uh, last week, which, which obviously came with the SEC preseason poll. And Texas is rated number two uh, coming out of Media Days, headed into the season in the, in the SEC preseason media poll. But also amongst the, amongst the, the talking heads around the country, they're really high on Texas. They, some of them believe Texas has a chance to win the SEC, if not compete for it, and at least just get to the SEC championship game in their initial year. And I'm here to tell you that the Texas Longhorns headed into the 2024 season are the most overhyped, overrated team in all of college football. And I'm going to break it down. Here's why. Now, first of all, let's start off with Steve Sarkeesian's comments. As Steve Sarkeesian said, he believed that this was the, the deepest but most talented uh, Texas team uh, that he has had. Now, keep in mind, Texas did lose 11 players to the NFL draft, which is a pretty high number. So uh, let's just start there. So Steve Sarkeesian is trying to feed me and tell all of us that his team is more talented now without the 11 players that were, that were just drafted as well. Now let's let's go position by position and kind of break this down of why most talented is is a, is a complete farce uh, in my opinion. So first of all, Texas between Texas's offense and Texas's defense, and the offense was no slouch. I'm not it's not a shade on their offense last year, but between their offense and their defense, their defense was the better side of the ball last year. And the reason why their defense was the better side of the ball because it all started up front. It started up front at the point of attack at the line of scrimmage. And Texas had two All-Americans, Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat. Well, Byron Murphy was a first-round draft pick. Tav Tavondre Sweat was a high second-round draft pick. Both of these guys were, you know, all first-team, first, first team, all Big 12. All, both of them were All-Americans. First and second-round draft picks. And you you want to tell me that Texas – now has more talented guys at that position, at, at the defensive tackle position. They have more talented guys now than what they had a season ago with two All-Americans and, and, and a first-round draft pick and a second-round draft pick. You know, you know, there, there may be a bridge on Mars that you're trying to sell me, but I do not want to buy it because I do not believe Texas is more talented at that, at, at, at that position. Let's go to linebacker. They had uh, Jalen Ford. Jalen Ford was a two-time, two-time first-team All Big Twelve, racked up over 100 tackles uh, in each of his last two seasons, uh, I believe, at Texas. He's no longer there. He also got drafted to the NFL. And then, and then you have guys like Ryan Watts, no longer there. Uh, you got Terrence Brooks, who entered the transfer portal, and their pass, their defensive passing secondary. Uh, their or their past defense was not really that good uh, a season ago. Texas was one of the worst uh, past defensive uh, teams in all of the country, and so now you are replacing those guys. I know I know they got you know tra Clemson transfer Andrew Makuba. I know they got Malik Muhammad, who who's who's a rising you know younger player. But there's no way you're going to tell me that Texas is more talented when when basically your backups. Your backups to the guys who were giving up a bunch of yards are now going to be the guys playing in addition to an Andrew Makuba. And Andrew Makuba, he's a solid player, but at the end of the day, if he was that great, he would already be in the NFL. So you so you so you kind of have to look at it from that perspective. I'm not saying that he can't play in the NFL, but if, if he was so great, he would have had a high enough draft grade than when he left Clemson, he would have went to the NFL. So that tells you that. He's 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 just a pretty nice player, but he's not he he's not an elite player at his position as well. Now let's shift over to the offensive side because I just told you that last year the defense between Texas' defense and Texas offense, Texas defense was the better side of the ball. The offense was no slouch. And the reason why they were no slouch is because you had Xavier Worthy, you had Adnai Mitchell, you had Jatavian Sanders, you had Jordan Whittington. 
And then you also had Jonathan Brooks. All those guys are gone. All those guys are gone. So I just told you that the defense was the better side of the ball between the defense and their offense. And you just lost all of your playmakers. Xavier Worthy, a first round draft pick, had tied for the fastest 40 time. And you're telling me that you're more talented without a guy who can take the top off of the defense without without a pseudo, you know, Tyreek Hill a type of a player. I'm not saying he's as fast as Tyreek Hill, but I'm just saying for Texas, uh, he, 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 well, he was that type of player for Texas. Now, I understand that, you know, they picked up Isaiah Bond. They got some guys in the transfer portal. But at the end of the day, these guys they got in the transfer portal, if these guys were that great, if they were eligible to go to the NFL, they'd be first round draft picks just like Xavier Worthy. I believe Adonai Mitchell was, what, a second round, third round draft pick? So they had Adonai Mitchell. They added Adonai Mitchell uh, last season in the transfer portal, and he fit in nicely. And then you had Jordan Whittington, who who is just, you know, Mr. You know, Mr. Kind of all everything in terms of the knowledge of the game. Very, very, uh, very knowledgeable. Had been there for a long time. And Jatavian Sanders, whoever drafted him in the fifth round, uh, they probably got a steal because he probably wouldn't have slipped to the fifth round had he not had some of those injuries middle of the season as well. And then Jonathan Brooks. Jonathan Brooks, uh, you know, end up getting hurt, probably would have led the nation in, in rushing uh, last last season had he not gotten hurt. So you don't have him. I understand they got C.J. Baxter, but C.J. Baxter did not really impress me last year. And here's why. You, you, you compare C.J. Baxter to Oklahoma's running back, Gavin Sawchuk, who really didn't start playing until the last six games of the season. And C.J. Baxter played all season, although albeit a backup role. Gavin Sawchuk didn't really start playing until the end of the season, and he, and he still was not the full-time, the all-time carrier for Oklahoma, and he outrushed C.J. Baxter last season. So I'm not saying C.J. Baxter is not going to be good, but I'm just saying that he's not um, – it's, it, if, you're, if you're ranking him as one of the best uh, running backs in all of college football this year, that that's not what I see from him this year. Maybe next year, year after, something like that, if he's still in college, but not this year. The running back position is too deep across college football to put C.J. Baxter as one of the, the best running backs out there. Now, yes, they still do return Quinn Ewers. They've got, you know, obviously Manning is the backup should something happen to him. And then, and then they do return, you know, four for, for starting offensive linemen. So that is the one good thing for them. But but the playmakers, it takes all, you know, football is a team game. It takes all 11 guys. And you lost, you lost a big chunk of those 11 on offense. And the playmakers, the playmakers, and now you're replacing those. And and, and to think that you're more talented now, you, you just can't sell me that bridge. You cannot sell me that bridge on Mars to tell me that Texas is more talented now than they were last year when you lost all of what you lost uh, via the via the via the um, the NFL draft and then obviously the transfer portal with uh, with 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 uh, with uh, Terrence Brooks um, as well. So at the end of the day, I feel like Texas is the most overhyped team headed into the 2024 season because they will not live up to the expectations of what people have placed on them. And the reason why is because they're just they're just not there yet as a program. Some people think that I've heard some people say that they believe Sarkeesian and Texas are at the same place that George is at right now where they can lose a bunch of players and still reload. Well, let's keep in mind this Sarkeesian's entering his fourth year. But really, this is only if, if he's building a team for his vision, this is only Sarkeesian's third recruiting class. Because when he first was hired, you remember he was hired after Jan he was hired after January 1st. So that 2021 recruiting class was already intact. So if if so if you're building a team of Sarkeesian's vision, this is only his third recruiting class. Georgia, compare that to Georgia. Georgia didn't get to the spot where they're at now to where to where they can lose, you know, 10 to 15 players in the draft and still come back and reload till 2021. Now, keep in mind, Kirby Smart, Kirby Smart was at Georgia or Kirby Smart's been at Georgia since 2016. So that's 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. It took him six years to really build that depth. And you're trying to tell me that Sarkeesian now has it in year four in, in a year that not even Saban had depth like that uh, at Alabama and, and not even Georgia had depth like that. And, and then you even go to some of the other teams like Clemson when Dabo, it took it took Dabo longer than four years to, to basically build that depth. So once again, you can't sell me that bridge 
on Mars trying to tell me that Texas is now at the level of Georgia when they're, they're just not. And you're going to see that this year because when you compare it to last year, all the players that Texas had, the 11 players that they had that went to the draft, the two first, the, the two first, uh, the, the, the two All Americans, the first round draft pick, the second round draft pick, and so forth and so on, they struggled with Iowa State, struggled with TCU, struggled with Houston, struggled with Kansas State, lost to Oklahoma, lost to Oklahoma, and, uh, and, 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 and now they're going into a much tougher conference, although they got the easier of the schedule between them and Oklahoma and a few others in the SEC, they're still going into a tougher conference. And now you don't have those 11 players that went to the draft. So, yes, I think Texas is the most overhyped team coming into the 2024 year. They are preseason ranked top 10. I'm going to predict that Texas does not finish the season in the top 15. Now, to say they won't finish in the top 25, they are in the SEC, so they will get the benefit of the doubt there, but they will not finish the season in the top 15. You can book it, mark it down. What do you guys think? Is Texas the most overhyped team? Is there somebody else that's the most overhyped team? Do you think that I'm crazy? I don't think I'm crazy. I will make a follow-up to this at the end of the year. We will see, but I believe Texas is the most overhyped team for all the things that I named. You can't say that I'm lying. Leave your comments down below, and other than that, I'm out.